Hopefully this is an amazing pod for everyone. And when you're 16, a lot of things are going on in your head. And I don't think you really have a, a grip on how to cope with a lot of things. Yeah. How, to, how to handle kind of maybe adult problems as a late teenager. And if you don't have to one, you don't talk to anyone. Like you have, all, you have missed calls, you have text messages, or you got your partner ringing you being like, what time are you coming home at? Or your mummy texting you being like, Poppy's this, Poppy's, Poppy's fine, Poppy's great, blah, 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 blah. Or like Randy Sinead messing me about something and you don't want to talk to anyone. Because you just can't even think, like you can't even, like the radio, the radio's on but you can't hear it. Millions behind closed doors, but you just can't pull out fucking some extra money to pay some of the hardest workers in the country. Fuck right off. I think it's disgraceful. I think it's one thing as a country we need to get right, whether you're in Northern Ireland or you're in Scotland or you're in Wales or you're in England. One thing we need to get right is paying the people in the NHS correctly because about all the public services that we have, that one is the most crucial, it's the most the most, the most loved by the country. But it's true, because you literally just seen that person, not alive and well, but you just see them alive and they were very, very sick. And then they just die. And you're like, left, like there's been many times I've just been left on like, Kick the fucking yeah, door for door and then the cab started and then some woman came over and be like, get away from here and then the cab She was the only one that had any sense. Whip this camera off the door. Yeah, I saw it today as well, that's why I mentioned it. Like, it made me feel kind of sick. All right, guys, welcome to episode two of the We're Not There Yet podcast. This is actually episode 2.2 because there'll be an episode that never gets released because of some technical issues. So Thomas knows about that one, unfortunately. But today we're sitting with my magnificent, beautiful girlfriend who is an a and &E nurse and the mother of my child, mm -hmm. Poppy. Mm -hmm. um, first things first, I want to mention a couple of people who said some nice things about the podcast. I appreciate it. Obviously very new to everyone and maybe people getting to see kind of a side of me that they haven't seen and getting to experience some great stories from guests like you, babe. Mm -hmm. Oh, I shouldn't say for you, kind of cringy, yeah. but... <laughs> I need to I need to get that one I need to get that one out that's one done um yeah so shout out to Emma for the lovely comment on YouTube shout out to Willie who is soon to be a guest on this podcast shout out to Ed shout out to Carrie and shout out to Paula thank you so much for all your nice comments about the podcast um so yeah Georgia give people a little bit of a, a rundown on who you are and what you do and what you've just came back from yeah, where I just came back from. Maternity? Oh, yes. So my name is Georgia. I'm Josh's partner. Where's Sila? Cameron? Are you? No, you can look at me. Um, I work in a and &E. I'm not going to say what hospital. Um, I just came back from work to from maternity after being off for a year. It's more than a year, was it? No, it was a year because the three months from COVID and then the nine months from maternity. So I'm only just back like about a month and a half now. So yeah. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that it? Just, yeah. I'm an a &E nurse, just back from maternity. Yep, yo, here we go. Yeah. Um, so how did you first become interested in a career as an emergency a &E nurse? And what led you to kind of Northern Ireland as your work location? Because some people obviously go over to the mainland um, for nursing, but you obviously stayed in Northern Ireland. I didn't originally. So to be an emergency nurse, you either have to be a general nurse and you can be a mental health nurse or a learning disability nurse. Mm -hmm. So I didn't train as a general nurse, I trained as a mental health nurse. Um, the general nursing field at that time, because that was like eight years ago, didn't really interest me. I was more interested in mental health because of my past and things going on in my family at the time. Um, so I was really interested in that because I had a counsellor when I was younger and I found him really, really helpful. So he made me want to be a mental health nurse because I wanted to help people like that. And then went and did a mental health treatment and then for some reason decided I want to be an any nurse. Okay. Because I think it was just more like, it's probably from watching 24 hours on any on TV and seeing like the really, really sick patients and then them having such a quick recovery time to being better and be able to watch that on TV made me really be like, oh my goodness, I really, really want to do that. Mm -hmm. That looks amazing. So how did you actually find the mental health mental health nursing? Like, was that a challenge for you? Did you go in there and realise, look, this isn't for me, I can't cope with these types of people or didn't like the, the work environment, you didn't like the general, you didn't feel like you were helping people, they were beyond help. Like, what, what was kind of your gripes with that? 
I just think I just find it like really hard um, because sometimes whenever people seek out mental health services, sometimes, a lot of the time, this is not the case, but sometimes they don't want to change and they've just been referred um, by their cheap GP or other services. Um, and it's really, really hard to help people that don't want help. Mm -hmm. So I find that really, really difficult. And also when you're trying to help someone with their mental health, it takes a long time because the mental health struggles people deal with, that has conjured up over years, years and years and years and years from their childhood even. So like you're talking 20, 30, 40, 50 years and trying to help someone within the small time frame that you have is extremely difficult. So I just find that I've just burnt out and I find that I just find it really, really difficult to, I don't know, feel that feeling that I felt one of my counselor helped me because he was able to help me in such a short space of time. So obviously I was very, very young, whereas these people have had mental health struggles for their whole life and that's obviously not their fault, but I just find it really, really difficult. And um, I still obviously, like I still enjoy it. Like I still have patients at the minute that um, go in with their various mental health problems and I still really, really like helping them and I have a lot of empathy for them. Um, but I don't really find it as enjoyable as the, like the general side, like the medical side mm -hmm. now. But back then I really, really, really enjoyed it. Okay, well, let's lift the mood for a second. I'm going to crack this and we're going to get a little tear for the pod. Okay. So, cheers. Hopefully this is an amazing cheers. pod for everyone. <clears throat> Boost, if you fancy um, sponsoring me. <laughs> Hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, just touching on kind of mental health there and speaking about you being young mm -hmm. and you had a counsellor. And what how young are we talking here? Uh, I'm going to say 16. So you were 16 mm -hmm. and when you're 16 a lot of things are going on in your head mm -hmm. and I don't think you really have a, a grip on how to cope with a lot of things yeah. and how to how to handle kind of maybe adult problems as a late teenager. Mm -hmm. So what kind of guided you during that process? What helped you cope? What helped you get to the other side? What helped you build yourself in a, a better person, a more resilient person? It was, it was the concert that I had at the time. Like... At that time, everything, like, i kind of been, like, toying with it in my head for a few years, being like, do I feel like this? And kind of, like, having panic attacks on and off and stuff, but didn't really, like, address anything. And then a, f a lot of things happened within my family and then other family members, and one thing just pushed me over the edge and I just couldn't cope anymore and had a food with panic attack whenever I went into school and cried my eyes out. And one of my PE teachers found me and she's like, Georgia, what is wrong? And I just cried and cried and cried and cried. So then she referred me to the counsellor in school and he was amazing. Like... I can't really exactly remember what I talked to him about, but I, I still remember his face. Like, if I've seen him, I'd know him, but I couldn't remember his name or anything. But he was just amazing. And he made me feel so much better. And being like, I can do this. Like, this now, right now is really, really hard. Mm. But there's a lot to look forward to. And I'm only 16. Is there any details, like, regarding kind of what you were going through at that time that you can share with anyone who maybe is going through the same thing? And <laughs> I mean, at the time... Like in my family, like we lost our family home and mum like lost their job and found out she was pregnant with my wee sister and one of my aunties like had like a miscarriage at the time and stuff. So everything just combined, just my 16 year old brain just couldn't deal with it. And I was just like, what on earth is going on? I just found it extremely, extremely difficult to cope. And I remember actually sitting on my 16th birthday, like crying and being like, I want to die. And like, that's not a normal thing for like a 16 year old to think. Mm -hmm. And like, that's horrible for anybody to think, never mind someone so young. Um, and then I don't think by that point, whenever I felt like that, my auntie had had the miscarriage and then I went in the school one day and my wee cousin went to the same school as me at the time when I was younger and she ended up saying to me about it. No, she said to me about it and then my auntie phoned me. I phoned my auntie after she told me and then from then, from the bus stop, I just cried my eyes out until I got into school and that was just like breaking point because everybody has a breaking point. You just go on and on and on and on and on, on, on until you hit the tip of the iceberg and you're like, I can't not do this anymore. No matter how much you try to push it down and push it down and push it down, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. There'll be some point in your brain where you will just flick and you just can't, you just can't cope anymore. It may not be something massive. It could be <laughs> dropping a spoon mm -hmm. or lock your coke getting stuck in the door or something or dropping your milk when you're coming in from the shop, but you just cannot cope anymore. So you mentioned there obviously about losing your family home, um, a miscarriage of your auntie. What was the other thing you mentioned? Um, my mum lost her job and stuff and found out she was pregnant with my wee sister at the time. So obviously that, that was the whirlwind because 
there was no, they had no house. Yeah. She was pregnant. She had no job. Yeah. Your auntie had just lost, you know, her, her, her baby. Mm-hmm. And you're 16 years of age. Mm-hmm. A 16 year old doesn't have the life experience to even know what's going on in that situation because mm-hmm. you can't earn any money. Then mm-hmm. you can't put a roof over your own head. Mm-hmm. You can't, basically you can't be feeling guilty for this kind of thing. They're not in your control really. Mm-hmm. Totally out of your control. So I think a lot of young people go through some tra- uh, traumatic experiences. I had a similar story. Not, yours is a lot worse. Um, not that we're weighing up stories here. <laughs> like, But um, whenever I was 11. We would never do that. <laughs> uh, whenever I was uh, 11 or so going in the first year um, during the financial crisis 2007-2008 um, my mum and dad had to sell their home uh, and during that process of selling their home because my dad had lost his job in the council um, and during that period there was six months um, basically over most of the summer uh, that we stayed in my granny's house and I remember feeling kind of down and weird and like didn't know what the what the crack was because I'm only so young and you see kind of the stresses that money can cause in the family and you feel almost semi guilty for something that you can't do anything about. Um so yeah, my coping me- mechanism was just reminding myself that I was a, literally a teenager, literally like twelve. I wasn't even a teenager, I was twelve, eleven. So I was able to block that out. You were older. Mm-hmm you were probably feeling totally different and it's good to hear that getting that help with a counsellor, was it a school counsellor I take it? Yeah. Yeah, so getting that help with a school counsellor was able to kind of take you out the other side of that. Mm -hmm. Do you still, does that still plague on your mind, that period? Is it almost like a a soft point in your memory? Is it something that still has emotion there or have you totally been able to get over that? No, no, like I still think about it and I still feel certain emotions about it and everything that happened at that time and I obviously like there's things I haven't spoken about at the time, etc. But like it was nobody's fault. Mm-hmm. Like it was just things that was completely out of my control, my mum's control, my auntie's control. Like it was nobody's fault and it was just really unfortunate that it all just happened in such a short space of time. Like I'm talking weeks. Yeah. So it was just so much for everybody to deal with. For me, especially my mum, like my mum had a really, really hard time because obviously it's her whole life. Yeah. Um, and then my auntie as well, obviously losing your kid is something that doesn't even bother thinking about. Yeah. I, I, as a man, I don't think we can ever know that that kind of bond and feeling that yeah. that is it, part of you. Because obviously... Yeah, cause I, half the time you forget about Poppy. I don't forget about Poppy. Yeah, you do. You're no, like, I don't. Sometimes I might and then I'm like, oh yeah. No, 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 no. Men have this almost instinctively put into them that whenever they're on the hunt, aka for me, that is on the ground, you you block out everything and have a sole objective. That mm-hmm. would have been, you know, in the prehistoric times, making sure that we ate. Nowadays, it's making sure we eat with money. You know, same kind of prerogative there, but mm-hmm. just going on about um, us talking about being teenagers and kind of them health, mental health struggles. We didn't really have social media then. Mm-hmm. It was Bebo, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. And even then, a lot of people didn't have Bebo. Thank God we didn't have social and media Bebo, then, I would not have been able to cope. Bebo had meals, so you couldn't instant message someone. You could only, like, send them, like, an email almost, but it was a Bebo. Yeah, but unless you were on, um, what did you call that? MSN. MSN. Yeah, so MSN was a different base, but you had to get their MSN. Yeah. Where nowadays, with Facebook, Snapchat, Insta, TikTok, you're very easily found. Um, and I find during that, like, we were the first generation of social, pardon me, <laughs> I'm talking about you, <laughs> I'm talking about you and here's me burping on the podcast. <laughs> what are you talking about me? I never burp. Yeah. You, I get told if you burp, you're out. Yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> um, what was I going to say there? Yeah, so we were like almost the first the first uh, generation that really went through social media because obviously our, our mums and dads and grannies and stuff, they didn't use it. Yeah. And Nessa jumped on it and started using, playing Farmville, if you remember that. Yeah. Um, so we kind of went through that. And I feel like we got out kind of lucky yeah, because I don't remember anyone really being bullied or anything on like social media because 
it just wasn't that accessible or it was slow or it was janky or whatever and there wasn't like big massive school group chats or anything like that that didn't really exist the only thing i remember was um what you call that ask fm or something Ask oh, where people something. were bastards to each other. Or like, behind, yeah, or like, like, ask me a question and it's anonymous. Being anonymous. Yeah, it yeah. was the worst because I did that once and honestly, <laughs> I fucking cried for weeks of things people said. Yeah, I, horrible. I never done it. It was I horrible, never horrible. And sometimes, you know, when your Facebook memories that comes up like 10 years ago today, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I would have shared like things being like, blah, 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 you fucking asshole. And then, like, yeah. then, like, then I click on, and like, no, I'm not gonna click on because it makes me feel bad again. Like, me bring me back to whenever I was 16 and feel, I felt like shit. See, kids these days don't even know because um, they don't, they don't even get to do the like for likes. Horrible. Do you remember? Do you remember the like for likes? <laughs> Good looking, seeing you in the park, beast drinker <laughs> or something stupid. I don't know, but I remember the like for likes. What was the other one? Like for a meal, uh, or a. Uh, the absolute belter that fellas used to do so you'd be with your mate or whatever you kind of fancied this chick or whatever and you were like right you know what I'm messaging her she's messaging me back right right ask her to meet you oh sugar <laughs> ask her to meet you and for anyone who's not from Northern Ireland meet means kiss like French kiss um, ask her to meet you you would say oh they fancy meeting me and they text back going oh, no and you go oh it was a mate that was a mate yeah. that sent that <laughs> <laughs> getting that yeah um, but yeah going back to being a teenager with social media and all the nasty yeah. things that happen these days Awful. where k- kids basically gang up on each other on social for any any reason because see when you're like 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 you don't, you don't have a big grasp on life You've, you're very much in this little bubble yeah. and then you'll say things that when you grow up and you'll, you'll be like why did I even think yeah. like that so, you see the Facebook memories I come back and I'm like yeah. Why did I write that? <laughs> yeah, your 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 brain is So, going from there recently in in Northern Ireland, and it breaks my heart. Um, there was a a thirteen year old girl, who was, it who was found dead. Um, obviously it was a big search party and stuff for, her and her mom shared it, and everyone shared it, and shared it super fast, mm-hmm. and she shared a, a a story of her putting on Snapchat bye. So, I don't think the details came out with that, but I think it's safe to assume with a Snapchat that says bye and then find dead, that this, this little lady, she's, she's went and done something horrible and God rest her soul, but I hope to God that wasn't around social media bullying mm. because we, when you're 13 years of age, you don't have a, a grasp and understanding mm. for the world. Everything, you've got a lot of hurt, you feel a lot of like emotion and you're just starting to get these... Um, hormones and you don't know how to cope with them and people say these nasty horrible things to you or mm-hmm. you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you break up with them and you're only 13, 14, 15 you think that's the end of the world like my, my life's over I'm heartbroken I don't want to be here anymore etc etc and when you grow up a little more you realise wait a second thank the Lord I was able to get through that little period where my mind just didn't know what was going on yeah. so for any for anyone it's who's awful. for anyone who's 13, 14, 15, 16, they just need to realise the feelings that they're feeling at that age and the surroundings they're in, if they're being picked on or if their little girlfriend or boyfriend left them or whatever it is, that that's this little tiny minute portion of your life that whenever you come to our age or even younger than us, you'll look back and go, Thank God I didn't do anything stupid. Yeah, because you have so much that you're gonna miss out on. Like if I had done something stupid back whenever I was 16, being like, I wanna die or going through the things I went through, I never would have got my life that I have now. I never would have the family that I have now. I would never have the job that I have now. I would never have the friends that I have now. I would never have the work colleagues that I have now. I would never have you. I would never have Poppy. Like I would never have my dog. Like there's so many things that you'd miss out on. Yeah. If you did that, like obviously at that time, you're feeling feeling so bad and to be able to do something like that, you have to be feeling pretty, 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 pretty low. Like the lowest of the low. Yeah, I can't even imagine how her mother feels because if I touch wood, that I never have to experience anything like that. But the pain, I, being a parent now, thinking that, you know, your child just didn't know what to do and they've done something that you can't come back from, essentially. For any child who's took their life um, 
whenever they're at a young age, they don't have an understanding. For anyone who even takes their life in general, you know, they're one in whatever it is, four trillion chance of even being born. So the fact that you're being born, you shouldn't take that for granted because even in your worst days, there's always a better day. Yeah. There's always hope. There's always there's always something to speak to. There's always a new opportunity. There's always a new you because I'm not the guy that I was five years ago. Just like in that moment where maybe you feel like life isn't worth living. There's a, there's a version of you out there that would look back and go, you were an idiot kid. Now you're on the other side. Yeah. So I'm hoping that anybody who maybe does feel like that just realizes that sometimes you just need to basically turn yourself into a new version yeah i mean it's it's really hard because the kids now and teenagers now are extremely ruthless yeah like one of my little sisters is i can't remember what she is 15 14 15 16 mm. and the stuff she gets said to her in school every day is disgusting yeah like disgusting things that are said to her see i th- i think i feel it's, it's different for boys i feel like because whenever i was like 14 15 if a guy says something <coughs> to me, it didn't matter how big or small you were if someone says something to you you just went in and you punched them <laughs> and yeah but that's not not the case now and girls especially wouldn't do that yeah i'm not saying girls like, the girl, home near mom and girls, dad be like yeah she said something and i turn and smacked her yeah girls are a different story but men or young men when you go in there and you've got someone who thinks that they, they're, they're bigger than you, they're wider than you, or they're they're smarter than you, they've got more friends than you, whatever it is, they'll give it the big ones and they'll try and bully you. It doesn't matter how big or small you are, but if you go in there and you stand up to them and you just hit them on, even if they beat you up afterwards, I guarantee you, they'll, as, a, as a young man who went through high school, I guarantee you, once you hit them, even if they did beat you up afterwards, they'll not do it again without thinking about it. Because I feel like if you don't stand up for yourself, you're setting the precedent. As a young man, this is not for a young woman. I haven't got any life advice for a young woman. You can maybe <laughs> you can maybe give a bit more of that. But for a young man, I would say in that situation, you just take the punch and then get beat up afterwards. And I guarantee you, whoever your bully is, will not do it again because they'll be going, I can't be bothered getting punched in the face. or they'll, You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas you think someone's an easy touch, you'll just constantly pick at them and pick at them because... In uh, my high school, there was some uh, there was some guys in my year. Now, I, I would like to think that I never bullied anyone. Might have been a little shit, but I was always like a bit of a nerd. Um, but there was guys in my year who essentially never stood up for themselves ever. And there would be quick targets for a job, quick targets for, you know, you got big feet or whatever it was, something stupid. So if for any young men who are like, 12 to 16 in school i say wait the pe class and just boom and then no, you can't be saying that. I, well that's what i believe yeah but that's because afterwards you might be along. best friends no yes yeah, no. well Cause my best again, friend, people... one of my best friends jack he walked down a corridor behind me with an other fella because someone in, in year uh in fifth year whenever i was first year said something and then two went to grab me they beat me up for this fifth year and see when they came down First thing I thought was, I'm punching whoever touches me. And it was Jack, it was Jack who grabbed me. I turned around, punched him, and then we started getting into each other. And then the vice principal ran down and grabbed, going, what are you doing? And Jack was like, Phew. and I was like, Phew. and Jack goes, we're just playing. And I was like, and I was like yeah, we're just playing. And we walked outside, and then next minute, a week later, he asked me to come out. And I were like, best mates. Yeah, but you still can't. We do not condone violence. I do not house. condone violence. This, this is pre- a preemptive strike. I'm not saying go beat people up. What I'm saying is if you're being bullied and you're being picked on, wait around the corner and headbutt them and then you're not doing anything. If you're being you're being picked on, tell your teachers, tell your mother, tell your dad. If your dad's a man, you'll sort it out. Tell your teachers. Yeah, sort it out for you. Your dad'll sort it out for you. That's what dads are for. A young man needs to understand that he needs to take his life with his own two hands. Yeah, but a young man needs to also understand by getting in a ruckus with another young man you could ruin that young man's life right forever what i'm saying is a quick punch and i didn't yep. say flip and slit someone's throat don't be doing that no one do one that one punch can kill look one punch can't kill when you're 12 years old yes it can. okay look guys corner of a I... wall curb the door <laughs> corner of a door do not punch anyone. Okay, I agree with Georgia, but I'm still sticking with okay. my own advice here that if someone's picking on you and you're a young man, stand up for yourself. And if that means if it comes to someone pushing you and you have to retaliate with a right hook, that I'm I'm all for it. 
So how do you maintain your mental and emotional well-being given the high stress nature of your work environment? Like what makes you <laughs> what makes you de-stress? Because obviously wine. <laughs> so that's your go to wine. I mean I find this very funny because I know a lot of nurses and especially any nurses and IT nurses, etc., will agree with me. I'm not gonna condone it, but a week must wine makes me feel better. Right. I mean, we have. I guess, like, <clears throat> obviously, going for walks, like reading books, watching shitty TV, you don't have to concentrate on, playing with a dog, mm-hmm. cleaning makes me feel better because living in a cluttered house makes me raging. Um. I mean, that's really it. Well, I like listening to music. Um, I like watching a movie to take my mind off things. I feel like you're giving and me your CV. I also here. kind of like watching 24 hours of the ending to de stress. That makes no sense to me at all. That's like, that's, <laughs> that's like. Yeah, but everybody does it. Everybody that, that works that... in any watches 24 hours of the ending. I don't know. Like, for, they oh. do. Right, okay. If that's how you want the de stress after just being in a stressful environment, you do you and anyone else out there who's a nurse who is doing that is kind of psychotic to me like but you you do you so uh, it's comfort isn't it yeah so basically what you're saying is you just come home you try not to think too much you just try and be lazy um but i know you just have to like decompartmentalize because if you think about what's just happened for the last 13 hours too much you're never gonna be able to sleep yeah and you're never gonna be able to have a life and you're never going to be able to be emotionally present with your kids or with your partner or with your family or just be able to be yourself because the things that we deal with every single day, the general public would not be able to do that. So just for, just go on then with, <laughs> with uh, some of the things that uh, the general public maybe don't, we don't really understand behind the scenes what's going on or, you know, for example, just watching 24 and NE with you, you keep talking about the big red phone and the big red phone goes off or whatever. It is. Not the big red phone. It's a certain phone though, isn't it? It's like a phone that goes off when that phone goes off. It's like sound the alarms, motherfuckers. It's go time. Like something big's coming in here and we need to be on the ball. Mm-hmm. So like explain some kind of common misconceptions of what goes on in NE. I mean, sometimes I've seen on like social media or things people have posted that uh, I was in NA today and I was waiting for however many hours and the nurses were at the nurse station and they were talking about pillows or they were talking about the date oh they were talking about pillows and he's a good life <laughs> pillows the date they went on at the weekend the steak that they got right. I mean people are giving off because the nurses are standing at our station talking about these silly things but these small conversations with your colleagues is what gets you through the day because it takes you out of so you're working in the area that you're in and a lot of the time it's a high acuity environment and the patients are extremely sick and they're extremely young some of them are obviously extremely old but it's very very hard to deal with and these very small monotonous conversations with your colleagues make you feel like you again and make you feel normal and like everything's okay and like because if you didn't have that and you didn't have the bond that you have with your colleagues and the conversations you're able to have Every day with them and the laugh you'll be able to have, you won't be able to do your job because you'll just be a stress head and you won't be able to cope because you need to be able to switch off at some point. And if that means talking about pillows or talking about steaks or whatever the other thing was that I mentioned, then so be it because the things that we see every single day is hard and it's horrible. Yeah, so one thing that you've mentioned to me before is... Get, you're you're very present around death. Death. You're almost like um, the last sight someone sees before they go to the other side, yeah. and it makes you think a lot about death. Mm-hmm. Kind of, you know, for people who haven't got the experience, something crazy like that. How do you how do you deal with that? Kind of um, on a day to day basis. You know, someone so someone comes in and unfortunately they don't make it and they go to wherever they go to. Like what what goes on there? Like. I mean, that in itself is <clears throat> the thing that I probably find the most difficult 
um, especially because a lot of the time they're very, very young. Like I've had people in their thirties die on me, really unexpectedly, and then um, them deaths and the unexpected deaths are extremely hard because a lot of the time you speak to the family and the family are like, oh yeah, they were just getting ready or they were just at a football match or they were just in the car or something and then they just dropped it and they're like 31 and you're like, this doesn't make any sense or like 58 and they just dropped it. Like, do you? Because like, you, everyone goes like, oh, next year I'll do this or tomorrow I'll do this or when I get home, I'll do this. But you don't know that you're going to be able to get there because you don't, do not know what's going to happen to you. So I think like that's what's extremely difficult for me because I constantly go in my head like blah blah blah, blah but then this could happen to me. This happened this happened to her, this happened to him. So why would this happen to me? Because it, it like in AD it just happens all around you. Like it was just like obviously there's good news and stuff and things like that, but a lot of the time it's bad news after bad news after bad news after bad news and trying to calm or like that in your head and trying to like reassure yourself, like you're okay, like it's okay, it's okay, like it's extremely hard. And when someone dies, a lot of the time, like you have a wee cry to yourself or you have a cry with your colleagues. And um, after a death, like we would have like a debrief. So like it would be all the nurses and the consultant and then like all the doctors that have been in with the death. And we would all stand, stand and discuss like what we find hard and what we need to improve on or what somebody did good, like their technical skills, I mean, like what they did good. Um, during like during that during the patient passing but I mean it's extremely difficult and then afterwards you're like you're kind of like your colleagues like I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine it's fine it's fine we're fine and then it's when you get in the car and you're going home and you don't even put the radio on you don't talk to anyone like you have all you have missed calls you have text messages or you got your partner ringing you being like what time are you coming home at or your mommy texting you being like poppy's this poppy's poppy's fine poppy's great blah 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 or like Randy Sinead messaging you about something and you don't want to talk to anyone because you just can't even think like you can't even like the radio the radio's on but you can't hear it because mm. you can just hear you can just hear like the beeping in your head like constant and then even afterwards when you come home and you get a shower and like even like when you're trying to go to bed like and you're just beeping like all night long and all day long in your head and then you still sometimes you still go like I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine, I'm fine and then you try and go to sleep and you just get flashbacks all day long all night long and then even like the next day or like days afterwards we things will remind you of it and you get flashbacks of it and for like a normal day-to-day -day person that doesn't have a job like that getting flashbacks or something like that is extremely traumatic because that is not a normal thing to experience so i think in the environment that i'm in it's only because like the team that i work with and the colleagues that i have are absolutely amazing and the team like is phenomenal like the skills that everybody has is amazing and like the companionship that you have and you know like if you had like a really really bad shift or you felt like oh i don't know if i should have did that or i don't is that right you know you could go home and like you could just text someone and be like even someone that you don't talk to like very very rarely you could just text them and be like was this okay or thank you so much for today i really really appreciate your help and it's reciprocated and it makes you feel like yeah like i'm okay like i did a good job like i tried my best and that's all you can do especially in a and &E, you can just try your best and especially not even any &E, in the nhs because the staffing that you have and the resources that you have are stretched to the maximum. And I don't think a lot of people understand that, but mm -hmm. you are stretched to your capacity and there's no room to put anyone. Like, so people will say a lot on social media, like, oh, so many ambulance waits to get into a and &E and so many hours and all this type of thing and blah, blah, waited for how many, for many hours in the ambulance. I think sometimes people think that means waited 10 hours in an ambulance for a bed on the ward. That means waited 10 hours in an ambulance for a bed in A&E. And that's where you then get assessed by a doctor and then you get decided on if you're going to be admitted or you're going to go home or what speciality you're going to go down. Like that's not a bed on the ward, that is to literally get in A&E because there is no space. I mean, I feel like what they should do is <clears throat> they should go around everyone who walks in the A&E's doors, go around every single one of them and take a £50 to £100 deposit from them being there. And if you go through that triage door and what you're there for is fucking stupid, you get that £100, £100 or £50 taken off you and told to go home. <clears throat> so know, you know what that would stop? It would stop a lot of people coming in and wasting resources in the NHS. But a lot of the time you can't, help, you can't do that because sometimes people come to a and &E and the NHS for social needs and they can't fulfil that themselves. Like they don't have anywhere to sleep. 
They don't have anywhere to get a drink. They don't have anywhere to eat. Yeah. The only place they have is the hospital. I mean, that shouldn't be the hospital's job I know, for a start. Because that's, that's the only safe place that they have. They don't have any other safe place. But all they got is you. But the, this is this is a place where people come when they're sick yeah. and they need a doctor or a nurse yeah. or a specialist to help them with their ailment. Not somewhere to go because you feel a niggle in your back or something like that. That is, I... I get infuriated whenever I hear some of the stories that people are coming in the NE with. It's like, that should be going to your doctors. So whatever the fuck we need to do with GPs to get them operational again. I mean, a lot of the time GPs say you need to go to a and but a lot of, like, 80% of the time it's genuinely, they do not need to come to a &E. Yeah. I mean... So I myself, not, not I myself, sorry, one of the nurses that I work with, Whenever it comes to triage, so triage is the bit after you book on a reception and you're like, my name is blah, blah, my address is, my date of birth is blah, blah. And then the nurse calls you 10, 15 minutes or five minutes later or whatever. And the day of blood pressure inside you, so what's wrong, what's wrong with you today? One of my colleagues, every single patient she triages, she says to them, so what's your emergency today? Mm -hmm. And you can just see the look on their faces because they're like, it's not an emergency. Yeah. Like a lot of the times, like, a lot of the times it actually ends up being that they do need medical attention and it's actually thank goodness they came to A&E because they actually needed it mm. but I mean coming up because you've got a sore toe or you've got your fingernail is sliced yeah or your back's been sore for a year yeah is not A&E's job yeah it's, it's not it's not it's an emergency department yeah. And I know like a lot of the time like that can't be helped because a lot of the time GPs don't have appointments and GPs are constantly panning people off and being like, go to any, you need to go to any. There's no appointments today, I'm not answering. And then sometimes like patients will come and tell me like they've had a sore back for six months, but they're trying to get through for a GP for to their GP and their GP is constantly like, no appointments, no appointments, no appointments, not answering, answering the phone, not answering the phone, a bank holiday, blah blah blah. And then they're like, you know what, I'm just gonna come to any because they know that we will see them no matter what. But how do we how do we fix this problem? Because it seems to be a whole UK wide problem with GPs at the minute. Where ever since COVID, it's COVID's been a big, a big driving factor for this. Because now there's a big, massive backlog. Mm -hmm. Because for the first twelve months of COVID, a lot of people were too scared to go into a health environment when they did have problems that should have been, um, probably seen early and given whatever they needed early doors to fix that problem. And now it's kind of manifested and. They're going, I need seen now, and you are the only people that'll do it right now because mm -hmm. it's kind of for the GPs. Yeah. I mean, me personally, I haven't been in years because you try and ring our local GP, it's 100 to 900 phone calls until you're through. For I mean, me, my local GP that is not here, that is still, I'm very sure, still within Belfast. Are is amazing. I know amazing. <laughs> they are the Shout best. Out to them. Shout out to them. I mean, it's just it's extremely hard for patients to get seen, and then it's extremely hard for them to get seen by their GPs, and then they come to us, and half the time we're triaged as a low category, which means they should be seen within, within so many hours, but because any is so bad, get them a their wait time is essentially tripled and by the time you come in for your next shift the patient that you triaged at eight o'clock at night when you're going off shift by the time you come in for your next shift at half seven the next morning they will still be there with no using my doctor this the, well, well i mean you can only put resources but, you can only stretch them yeah so and thin. it's not fair because the patients that are in resource so the sickest of the sickest that need one-to-one -one nursing attention which by the way never happens mm. so you have like You'll have two nurses or three nurses working there and at a max you'll have eight resource patients. Mm. So your two one nurse could go on their break and the other one could be going to CT or going to do this or blah 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 or could be the half break. So at one point you are on your own with eight resource patients. So this is the sickest of the sickest patients in the whole of any that oh. need continuous observation. How many mental and health? And continuous treatment. How many mental health? I mean I think the normal ratio for a nurse on the ward is for this is like not high acuity patients. I think it's like maybe like five. Right. And that's low acuity. Like that's like people that only need their blood pressure checked once a day or twice a day. And where we have the resource patients that need their blood pressure checked continuously or every 15 minutes. Well, thank God we have such amazing nurses then because if we didn't. I'm and out. the treatment that you have to give them constantly for their various conditions or 
there are oxygen machines that you need to adjust for their various conditions. You need to spend a lot of time and attention on them because if you don't, if there's something you don't notice, because the doctor may necessarily not notice it, or maybe the doctor has got pulled away to the next sick patient or whatever. If you don't notice that, like that, like your patient like could deteriorate like that, and that's your fault because yeah. you didn't notice it. Are you inside? Because there's no resources, because there's no one else to come and help, because you're by yourself. Thank goodness we have great, great trained nurses who are able to basically clone themselves during shift. Um, and again, these are underpaid in my opinion, massively underpaid, especially Northern Ireland where you get paid less than the mainland, which to me just does not make any sense at all. And for so, how, how many years you need to be in the university and the actual job that you do, that's a very, very tough job. A job not a lot of people, because I couldn't do that job. Most of my friends couldn't do that job. We're not that way inclined. But you are literally saving people's lives. You are the gateway. The doctor and the nurses are there. Are the gateway between someone's life and, and some, or someone dying. Whenever, that's probably the most important job you can possibly have. Yet we're scrimping and saving every single penny instead of giving pe nurses. Especially nurses, obviously. There's other people in there who could do a pay raise as well. But the nurses, are, since the 19, it was the 1980s or 1970s, he's got a massive pay raise. I feel like we're coming to the point now where we need to give you another massive pay raise because you can't be you can't be underpaying people who save people's lives. It's not yeah. right. And also shout out the cars and the porters yep. and the domestics and the kitchen staff who's all amazing. Yeah, well, honestly, see it without some of my nursing assistants and my cars, I would not be able to do my job, and I would be half a nurse than I am. Right, they well, are amazing, and they get paid fucking buttons. It is disgusting what they get paid. Like, I mean disgusting. I don't care that I went to university for three years. Some of them care assistants and then their sisters I work with have more common sense and more knowledge sometimes than a qualified nurse because they have been doing that job for 20, 30 years. They are amazing and the buttons that they get paid is disgusting. I it, mean, you can't even say capitalism really kindly because they're paid I mean, by the government. So it turns me. The government's in there all doing insider trading and getting their 75 to 100k a year, whatever it is in the parliament. Uh, or over here, I think it's like 45 to 60k. But they're all, they've all got their own businesses. They've all got their own stakes in, in um, different companies with stocks. So it looks like, oh, we're only making 75 grand when you're actually pocketing millions behind closed doors. But yeah. you can't pull out fucking some extra money to pay some of the hardest workers in the country. Fuck right off. I think it's disgraceful. I think it's one thing as a country we need to get right whether you're in Northern Ireland or you're in Scotland or you're in Wales or you're in England. One thing we need to get right is paying the people in the NHS correctly because about all the public services that we have, that one is the most crucial. It's the most, the most, most loved by the country because during COVID, or during COVID, what did everyone do? Support our NHS, support our NHS. But yes, yeah, support our NHS while we underpay people and make them literally go borderline <clears throat> broke. You know yeah, what I mean? Sporting NHS and the clap for us, but a few weeks ago, a patient near, near tried to assault me, and it happens to people in the NHS every single day, where they get verbally assaulted, they get physically assaulted. It's not fair. And people are there to do their jobs. You wouldn't treat your own child like that, mm -hmm. or you wouldn't accept someone treating your child like that. So why would you speak to someone that's there to take care of you, that is paid to take care of you? Why would you speak to them like that? Or why would you treat them like that? Or why would you threaten them like that? It makes no sense to me at all. Well, I mean, our NHS is free. So you do get people who just don't have respect towards their, the yeah, services they're receiving. Yeah, it's free, but I'm a human being. Absolutely. And everyone I work with is a human being. They're there to serve you. They yeah. make you feel better. All we want as nurses, and that's why we went in the profession, is to make people feel better and make people feel good and make people feel positive, make people feel like, oh, yes, I feel so much better now. Thank God for that nurse. Mm -hmm. So why then would you speak to your nurse like a piece of shit I or threaten them? I do not understand. And I think people like that should never be allowed back in the NHS ever again because it is disgusting. I am not here to be abused. I am here to do my job. And I think a lot of people forget that because they're like, it's free, I pay for it, my blah, blah, blah pays for it. You do not pay my wages and I am not here because you pay me. This is my job, I am a person. Do not speak to me or treat me like this because you would not speak to your own kid like this nor would you appreciate someone else speaking to a kid like this. I agree with you on, all, on almost all of that. I feel like anybody who comes in the NHS, there should be a three-strike rule and after the third strike that... 
you know, I don't know, you're going to have to come it's in. Disgusting. Come in and like, I've heard about like people that. like literally being stabbed and abused by patients or being followed and being stalked for months. Disgrace. Or being abused and it's like, what? Disgrace. It doesn't make any sense. Like, I've never heard of anyone in any other profession that gets treated like that. Just like an artist being yeah. stabbed or being abused or being stalked or to provide this art piece for you and then you're like, you're a piece of fucking shit. I'm going to do this to you. Fuck you. No. I, I, I don't know what that's you about. You don't? I have to disagree with you on one thing though. You do get paid by the taxpayer. Yeah, but it still doesn't matter. You personally do not pay my salary. No, they so don't. You, the... Even if you did, even if you did, still does not mean you can speak to me or threaten me absolutely the not. way that you do. Absolutely not. Absolutely disagree. Because that's like pin your oil man being like come deliver me 500 litres of oil and then it gets here and like you're a fucking piece of shit spit in his face fuck you fuck you you can't get my oil you're in shit. there you don't Look know how like to do your kid. job would you do that no never. Oh. oh shit no you wouldn't or the person in the shop that served you would you be like you're a piece of shit love well you do have some cans. or you're fat like all my colleagues are called fat all the time and get gassed are you pregnant <laughs> <laughs> right, well, let, let's just uh, have a couple of questions, keep these nice and short because we're coming to the end of the pod. Um, what advice would you give the aspiring emergency nurses or healthcare professionals who are considering a career in this field? I would say only do it if you have massive balls. Massive balls. And you have a lot of patience. Right. Because your patience is extremely challenged because of the limitations put on you because you have no staff. Not even a staff, even if you're highly staffed, the acuity of the patients coming at the minute is very, very high and trying to deal with, deal with that is a lot. And don't forget also within the, even if you're well, well staffed, within that you don't necessarily have staff that have been qualified for many, many years and worked in the emergency department for many, many years. Like you may have the four nurses that have came and like migrated over, which are, they're amazing. Or you may have like, someone that's only back from maternity leave or you may have someone that's only just started so the skill level is hard trying to match all that skill level up together um but it's an amazing career and it's amazing I and mean, i love my job like my job is my passion and i love it like i would never ever do another job and i tell you all the time i am never quitting my job i will never leave my job because i love being an NA nurse and it fills me with such pride and such enjoyment that i'm able to do this for people like because you can literally see people coming around and saving their life right in front of you. Yeah. And it's an amazing feeling. And especially if you get to work with a really, really good team, like it'll be the best thing you've ever felt in your life. So you would recommend it? Yeah. For anyone who's got it. I would recommend it if you are mentally resilient, mm. you have a lot of patience, you have a lot of empathy, mm. you're a hard worker. Okay. And you like people. If you're any, not anything of the above, do not work in any. Do not work as a nurse in general, though? Do not work in any. So you can still be a nurse? I mean, I don't know. I've never been a ward nurse before. I've never been a community nurse before. So I can't vouch for that. All I've ever been is, apart from one year somewhere else, is an any nurse, so I don't know. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so another quick fire question. Do you find that because you are almost the gatekeepers in, in life and death, and um, these are around kind of, that experience of going to the other side, from just transitioning to the other side, do you find that health professionals are religious or are they less religious? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I'm not really religious, but anytime one of the patients die, I bless myself and kiss them on the forehead with my hand. So I go like this, and then kiss my lips and then put it on their forehead before I zip up their body bag. But I would say, mm, I don't know if it's because of nurses or if it's because just people in general. And not very many people in my work are religious. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm going to say there's probably about like 40% that are like religious, but like, you know, they're religious, like they are Christian, like they ne would never swear or anything like that. And then there is obviously people like, like me that believes there's something there but I'm not quite sure what there is mm. um so I don't really know that's a good question I think it's kind of more reflective in like society where like a lot less people are religious 
Mm. And then there's some people that are religious, but you, you don't know. So you find it's kind of almost the same society then, like, but yeah, it's just because you are you are around think... death. I've never seen anyone die personally, but everyone in your thing sees death a lot, so it almost gets you ticking and thinking about the existential world and space yeah. and time and yeah. you being here when you watch the life dream from someone's body. Because one minute they're saying hi, Georgia, the next minute you're wrapping them up in a body bag. This gets sent to the morgue, so. For me personally, I reckon that would make me very. It would make me think a lot more about religion and life itself. I, I don't know if it makes people kind of go the opposite. Okay, so they become numb to it, and it's just it's part of whatever this is. This it's around about life. Because a lot of people, whenever you see that every single day, and it's in your personal life, every day, or it's there for like three days a week but it's happened to you two or three times on a shift or it's been a really really young person that's really really affected you you kind of go in your head I'm going to die anyway or not because <laughs> you literally just seen that's that. very bleak but it's true because you literally just seen that person not alive and well but you just see them alive and they were very very sick and then they just die and you're like left like there's been many times I've just been left on her like what the fuck just happened yes. and you're shocked and like so many times that I cried because I've been like, what the, f- like, what the fuck has just happened? Yeah. Like, that should not have happened. Like, that is not okay. Like, this doesn't make any sense. And it's a lot for, like, someone's brain to get around. Mm-hmm. That, like... They're gone. It's just like that. Yeah, just like that. And, like, you, can s- you just see the whole life journey from their face and, and the colour and everything. So is that, is that how someone dies? Like, does just eyes go behind their head? I mean, everybody, everybody dies differently, but... but I mean, I mean the patients you... that die right in front of you... Depends on how they've died. Sometimes they've been red from head to toe because they're hypoxic and they're hyperventilating. And, they're <laughs> and then when they die, it's just they're being very red in the face, and then the whole color drains from their head to the toe. And then so their eyes are still open and all, and they're just no. like just not. Their yeah. eyes are really closed. They're... They go, <sighs> That's fucked. That's or That's sometimes, fucked. sometimes <laughs> they just drop like that and then they're just with their mouth open and their eyes open and then you, you have to physically close your eyes and lift their jaw so that because you're <laughs> I can't think I did as a camera but your mouth when you die is like this so you have to like physically before Rick and Morris sits and like bring their jaws open and shut their eyes oh gosh that's... or if they've got if they're intubated or they've got some sort of airway and you have to take the airway out so the airway is like a big tube that goes down their throat so they can breathe well so you can breathe for them so sometimes they're always left in if they need a postmortem, or sometimes it's not. Um, so you have to take, you have to extubate them and take their airway out, and then a lot of the times that stops you from being able to put their jaw shut. So their mouth just like a. Right. Okay. Well, that's pretty graphic detail. So <laughs> if you're listening, if you're li- if you're listening on the the audio Trigger experience, trigger warning. If you are, if you're on the audio experience. Nervous. Or feeling comfortable talking about death or what death looks like, do not watch this. Yeah, if you're on the audio experience, you're gonna to have to go on YouTube and see kind of George's actions there and how death kicks in because no, sounds it's, grim. It's actually, looks it's grim. not funny. It's not funny. Like it is so dramatic. I know. So it's not funny. Let's go into another recent topic and then we'll just finish up with this one. Um, but I don't know if you've seen the video that's circulating on Facebook at the minute with um a girl down in Lurgan who have you not seen this no so there's a girl down in Lurgan and she shared a ring doorbell video oh yeah and then and the, people were trying yeah, to get in yeah. house yeah 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 so watching that about? watching that I was like what the flying fuck is going on with people that this was a single mum with her kid in the house and two fucking rats by the way so like just block. You could tell they were blocked. They were really pissed. They were drunk, and they just run up this girl's house to start smashing it to say you're a fucking fiend. Yeah. Yeah. out. Now, <clears throat> we currently live in a very Protestant area, and my side of the family are Protestants, and I would say there's not a single person in my family that holds that that kind of hatred and blood for someone. Now. Does some of my family support, you know, being a union? Yes. Do they support fucking attacking people? No. I think that's the days of the 1980s where you would just hate someone for no fucking reason. Like, just, you know, you're you're a certain religion. I hate you. Fucking retarded. And imagine just because you, you come from a certain side of society that 
you think you have the right to say that to someone and attack them. And did you, did you watch the video? Yeah. I they know, kept trying to kick line. the fucking yeah, door for him. And then the cap started, and then some woman came over and be like, get away from here. And then the cap She was the only one that had any sense. Whip this camera off the door. I'm going to beat the... Oh, ah, that old fucking I only seen that. Yeah. yeah, I saw it today as well. That's why I mentioned it. Like, it made me feel kind of sick. Yeah, disgusting. Like, I don't care if you're Catholic. I don't care if you're Protestant. I don't care if you're fucking Buddha. Don't care what the fuck you are. You don't go to someone's fucking house because you dislike their religion and try and fucking kick their door through. Now, apparently nothing's been brought forward with this person. Like, there's no there's no charges, but this girl is now couch hopping away from that house. I'm sure she is. So, so someone like that should drag. be just fucking thrown away for a bit and, and rehabilitated to think you're a fucking idiot. You need to start understanding that's a human being. You can't just hate human beings for some... For t- like, we're talking about death. That's that's important. Life and death. Not someone's fucking religion. I mean, it's also like saying that you hate someone because of the colour of their hair. Fucking stupid. Doesn't mean fucking anything. Doesn't mean anything. It's actually ridiculous. Like it's, it, it, it's it puts it puts stupid. a very negative light on Northern Ireland. It's actually very very stupid because there's a lot of people that I know that are very heavily way on their religion. I'm Protestant. I'm Catholic. I go to the this and the that and blah blah. Whereas I'm very very grateful for my mum and dad where I was brought up. That was not even important. It mm. did not matter. I was never told if I was a Protestant. I was a Catholic. It did not matter. It was never shoved down my throat. My dad was a Protestant, brought me to the 12th, like I think like once or twice, or mm-hmm. maybe he brought me more, I just can't remember because I was a kid. No big deal. My mum is not a Protestant, my mum is Catholic, and mm-hmm. so is all of her family, and I love it. And like I have no issue with it, like it doesn't, it doesn't change anything about how I feel about anyone. So yeah. I just think it's actually ridiculous that you would be like, because I'm a Protestant, I'm going to treat this person because they're a Catholic like a piece of shit. And like they're a scumbag. Keep politics of politics. If you agree with being in the union and you agree with United Ireland, that's politics. That's cool. It's cool to have different opinions. And yeah, whatever. I don't even understand what anything means. Do that. But, but keep... see this. See this. Catholic and Protestant. It doesn't mean fucking anything. That's what I'm saying. Just so shut keep up. it as politics. Doesn't mean anything. I agree with a certain thing as in the union or I agree with I want the United Ireland. That's cool. That's politics. You know, there's two two people with two different views. I don't even know what they but mean. the fact the fact that because you identify with a certain religion or you come from a certain area that you should just hate each other, that's something we need to get rid of. I feel like our generation's much more open and normal the to kind of numb to that almost. We're kinda of yeah, like, like I feel like whatever. whenever whenever Poppy's like older she's gonna be like, What? Yeah. What does but, that mean? People like, like that. I remember my daddy taking me to the 11th, 11th, 12th once or twice when I was a kid. Yeah. Like what I'm saying right now, but it was never done in my head as important because it's not important. That's literally me being like, I hate Jory because he has brown hair. Yeah, I feel like... Fuck you, Jory, and your brown hair. I feel like it's put a very <laughs> negative, uh, negative light on the country as a whole. I feel like it, it, make it makes any us sense? look like we're still in the dark ages. Northern Ireland isn't like that anymore. People are a lot more accepting of each other. I feel like, don't, I don't care if you go to the most dissident part of Northern Ireland or the most loyalist part. If you speak to the normal people of it, they'll just say, I, yeah, we like going to the bands or whatever and we like the bonfires and then the other side, we like Paddy's Day, we like going to Gaelic and, and playing Hurley and all the rest of it. I don't care about all the hatred. And I hope to God, when Poppy's a little bit older, that our generation will be older as well and I don't feel like we're, th- we're that bitter about things. And we'll keep our politics where our politics needs to be. I will not be trying to kick people's fucking doors through. I mean, I think because a lot of it, I don't understand any of it because I have no interest in it because I, I was not brought up that way. It's not important. Yeah. I feel, again, there's no in a bad light. Yeah. Don't want to see it. feel like that guy, he has a, apparently a window <coughs> cleaning business. Wouldn't that clean my fucking windows if he no. wants to fucking get on the gap? It comes to the side if he told the fuck off. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, <laughs> I think we'll, we'll end it on that. Thank you very much for, for jumping on the pod and I appreciate your, your feedback and hopefully the people listening and the people watching kind of get a bit of experience around and a bit of an understanding about how important your job is in society and well, we all appreciate you for the hard work and we don't want you to be underpaid but the government are bastards and we don't have a, a say on that but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.